Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to Civil Disagreements. And this particular Civil Disagreements webinar is on uh, whether or not the major questions doctrine is sound constitutional interpretation and, you know, the merits. Uh, and if you know nothing about the major questions doctrine, uh, you are definitely going to come away learning more. Uh, so the Civil Disagreements series is sponsored by uh, the American Bar Association's Division for Public Education, uh, and I work within that division. Um, it's also co-sponsored by the Chicago chapter of the American Constitution. Constitution Society, as well as the Austin chapter of the ACS and the Chicago chapter of the Federalist Society and Reform for Illinois. So we have done several, I believe six of these so far. So uh, we can put a link in the chat to all of the past programs, which also live on YouTube. So um, I am going to serve as the official timekeeper for the webinar, provided that I uh, don't lose my internet access, which has happened already uh, twice this morning. So that's scary. But um, and then my colleague, Catherine Hawk, is also here, and she's going to be acting as the debate moderator. Thank you, Tiffany. Uh, good afternoon. Good morning, depending on where you're joining us or happy whatever time of day it is, if you're joining us recorded after the fact. Uh, as Tiffany mentioned, I'm Catherine Hawk, uh, Deputy Director of the American Bar Association's Division for Public Education and Editor of the American Bar Association's Supreme Court Preview. I'm honored today to be joined uh, by our two esteemed panelists in this debate program. Uh, I will introduce them in a moment, but before I get to that, a few housekeeping matters. Um, <clears throat> this will be scheduled or formatted as a formal debate followed by an informal discussion period. Each of our panelists will have 15 minutes to prepare to prepare or to present prepared opening statements, followed by a three minute rebuttal. And then we will turn to a discussion format. Uh, we will be taking audience questions during that discussion period. So please use the chat feature throughout our program to submit your questions and we'll pass those along to our panelists towards the end. Um, <clears throat> CLE has been applied for uh, within the state of Illinois for any Illinois licensed attorneys. Uh, that information will be made available both in the chat towards the end of the program, as well as over email toward uh, after the program has concluded. Um, with that, I will uh, turn it over to our panelists with a little bit of introduction. Our first panelist or discussion this, this afternoon will be Ian Milhauser, who is the senior correspondent at Vox. There, he focuses on the Supreme Court, the Constitution, and the decline of liberal, liberal democracy in the United States. Before joining Vox, Ian was a columnist at Think Progress. Among other things, he has clerked at the Sixth Circuit and served as a Teach for America Corps member in the Mississippi Delta. He received his BA in philosophy from Kenyon College and a JD magna cum laude from Duke University. Uh, he is the author of two books on the Supreme Court, one entitled Injustices, the Supreme Court's History of Comfort Comforting the Comfortable and Afflicting the Afflicted, it's a bit of a tongue twister, and The Agenda, How a Republican Supreme Court is Reshaping America. We are also joined by Lou Capozzi, who is the Associate, uh, associate Attorney at Jones Day in Washington, D.C., and is a trial lawyer, appellate advocate, and former U.S. Supreme Court clerk. Lou recently participated in a multi-week bench trial during which he cross-examined important fact and expert witnesses. He has also authored briefs at various points of litigation from evidentiary motions to appeals. Prior to joining Jones Day in 2023, Lou served as a clerk to Supreme Court Justice Neil Gorsuch, as well as on the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals and the Third Circuit Court of Appeals. In addition, Lou serves as a lecturer in law at the University of Pennsylvania Pennsylvania Carey School of Law, and he is the president of the Federalist Society, Washington, D.C., Young Lawyers Chapter. So as you can see, we have a very uh, robust discussions today for hopefully a really engaging and edifying discussion. Uh, so with that, as Tiffany mentioned, the proposal for today's debate is resolved that the major questions doctrine is sound constitutional interpretation. And so with that, Ian, I'm going to pass it over to you to take the negative. <laughs> 
All right, thank you. I mean, I feel like I almost am going to win by default here, if that's the framing of the question, because the court has never provided an explanation for where this thing comes from. There are some concurring opinions that, 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 that offer some explanation. Gorsuch has claimed that it can be found in the penumbras and emanations from the non-delegation doctrine. Uh, Justice Barrett wrote an opinion, and I know this sounds very very silly, but I swear I'm not making it up, where she says that the major questions doctrine is implicit in a parable involving a babysitter. So, you know, some justices have offered some creative theories for why this major questions doctrine exists. But the six Republican justices who created this doctrine have never cited any statute or any constitutional provision which justifies the existence of this thing. And, and you know, and so my, my, my first question when I saw this doctrine begin to materialize is what is the legal basis for? Um, and, and the closest I was able to find um, while the justices who support it have again never written a majority opinion saying where it comes from, um, saying that it comes in from any constitutional provision or any statute. Um, Chief Justice Roberts's majority opinion, West Virginia EPA, West Virginia EPA, did say it comes from quote unquote our precedent. Now, just so we're clear, when the Supreme Court says something derives exclusively from our precedent. What they are saying is that they made it up. It, you know, if it, the fact that the Supreme Court said something in 2024 doesn't make it any less made up because they also said something similar in 2014. Normally, we expect courts to begin, you know, you know, when they create a legal doctrine or they, you know, begin some sort of new legal thread to cite something. You know the, the due process clause, Article Twelve, the uh, you know the, the the separation of powers clause, something to justify the existence of this new thing. But anyways, Robert says it comes from our precedent, um, and so what are the precedents that Roberts cited in his opinion, which is the only majority opinion actually purporting to say this comes from anywhere? Um, Roberts, like most scholars, um, starts with the Supreme Court's decision in Brown v. Uh, FDA v. Brown and Williamson. Um, and this was, you know, this was a pretty significant case. This was a case from 2000. Um, the question in Brown and Williamson was whether then existing law, um, whether then existing law allowed the FDA to regulate tobacco. Um, the, the Congress has since amended the law to say that they can, but at the time, this was an open question. And Justice O'Connor wrote what I thought was an extraordinarily persuasive opinion. I mean, like, if anyone out there teaches persuasive writing, like, this should be included in your curriculum. It's a very good opinion, laying out why the statute as it existed at that time does not. Um, and her opinion is divided into three parts. So first, she has a textualist section. And the textualist section says what had happened in the Brown and Williamson's case is that the Clinton administration had created a fairly complex and ambitious series of regulations intended to prevent children from smoking. And Justice O'Connor looked at the text of the statute and she says, you know, actually, if you read the text of the statute, it doesn't allow the FDA to do that specific thing. It doesn't allow them to do this complex web of regulations. And if we were actually conceived the point that it allows them to regulate tobacco, then the text of the statute would require the FDA to ban tobacco in its entirety. So the first section was just saying, look, as a matter of text, the text just unambiguously does not allow the Clinton administration to do the specific thing that they tried to do. Um, the second section was a legislative history section. And the legislative si history section, you know, I know there's a big debate over when it's appropriate or not appropriate to use legislative history. But in this case, I think the legislative history argument that O'Connor laid out was extraordinarily compelling. Because it turned out what had happened in the context of tobacco regulation is Congress had passed six bills dealing with the pr problem of youth smoking. And before they passed those bills, they would frequently hold hearings 
and they would call the FDA director or senior member of the FDA in to speak at these hearings. And the FDA, and they would ask the FDA director, hey, like, are you allowed to regulate this now? Do you currently have the statutory authority to regulate tobacco? And consistently over the course of the process of, of writing six different bills, the FDA said, no, we do not have that power. So Congress knew that the FDA did not have the power under existing law. It wrote six different bills to deal with the problem of you, uh, of you smoking. None of them gave the FDA the power to regulate the, the, the um, to regulate cigarettes. And again, like that's just really compelling legislative history pointing to O'Connor's conclusion that no, um, the, the FDA was not allowed to do this particular thing. And then she has this third section. It is far and away the shortest part of the opinion. It has this line that was quoted by a million law firms that sue the federal government after it was handed down because, you know, I mean, that's what lawyers do. They find the one line in any opinion that supports their client's position. And so the one line that everyone loves to quote, um, let me find it in my notes, is that we are confident that Congress could not have intended to delegate the decision of, su of such economics and political significance to an agency in so cryptic a fashion. So she's saying that the particular statute and the particular provision that the Clinton administration relied on to do this illegal web of tobacco regulations, it's a little too cryptic. And that is one piece of evidence to throw in the mix alongside, um, you know, the textual evidence and the statute and the legislative history evidence that I've that I've already laid out. It's really hard to tell from the opinion, though, like how much weight this one piece of evidence is supposed to carry, or how much weight it carried in O'Connor's mind. Because again, this is in a short rump third section at the end of the opinion. She's already laid out such a compelling case for her conclusion in the first two sections that she's really just gilding the lily here when she, when, when, when she adds on this third section. But I do wanna quote another part of that third section, which I think indicates that she did not intend for it to mean that she was creating any kind of expansive new doctrine. That means any time you have a statute that's kind of vague or any time that an agency declares that it's gonna do something ambitious, we just have a per se rule that the agency is not allowed to do it. So, and I just wanna read this section of, of that third section of her opinion to y'all. Owing to its unique place, in American history and society. Tobacco has its own unique political history. Congress for better or worse has created a distinct regulatory scheme for tobacco products, squarely rejected proposals to give the FDA jurisdiction um, over tobacco and repeatedly acted to preclude the agency from exercising significant policymaking authority in the area. Given this history, and the breadth of the authority that the FDA has asserted. We are obliged to defer not to the agency's expansive construction of the statute, but to Congress's consistent judgment to deny the FDA to this power. So she's being pretty clear here that she is writing an opinion that is about this one statute. Like the, the, the reason why I find this opinion so persuasive is unlike the judges that dominate the Supreme Court now, O'Connor wasn't trying to make sweeping pronouncements. I mean, th this, this reads much more like a trial judge's decision than it, th th than it does like something that would come out of the modern Supreme Court. She is analyzing the question in front of the Supreme Court. And she presents a very compelling case that, you know, the statute should be read the way that she, that she says it should be read. And then she just piles on evidence. And a small part of the pile is this one line that proponents of the major questions doctrine like to quote as if it is significant. As far as I can tell, the Supreme Court didn't actually start talking about the major questions doctrine as if it was a doctrine. 
you know, as if it, you know, as if it is applies in any circumstance other than like, you know, the narrow and very fact specific circumstances in Brown and Williamson until the Obama administration. And there were two quick cases that brought up the major questions doctrine during the Obama administration, utility air v. EPA and King v. Burwell. And both of them dealt with strong. So like, I just want to walk you briefly through the both of those cases. Utility Air was the first case to use the line that major questions doctrine proponents love to quote. I'm just going to read this line from Utility Air. We expect Congress to speak clearly if it wishes to assign to an agency questions of vast economic and political significance. That's like the one sentence definition that the Supreme Court always quotes when they want to provide a definition of this thing. But like the regulation that, that was actually at issue in utility air was very odd. I'm going to try to summarize it concisely. It's environmental case, so it's kind of hard to do, but let me do my best. Um, so EPA decided that it was going to start regulating CO2 emissions by stationary sources, which means buildings. And as it turns out, now, um, there's a good textualist argument that they had the right to, that they had the ability to regulate that to regulate CO2. But when you actually dug down into the statute, the statute imposed <coughs> a cap on admissions by, by, by stationary sources. And if you applied it to CO2, it meant that basically no one would ever be able to build a hotel again. No one would ever be able to build like an urban apartment building again, because the, the threshold was so low that it was just impossible to do any to, to do anything if the FDA tried to do that. And so the FDA, recognizing that it had claimed the power to do something ridiculous, then said, well, we're also going to write the regulation. We're just going to change this 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 threshold, even though it's written to the statute and there's no regular, there's no, nothing in the statute saying that the, that the EPA has the power to change this threshold. So it was a ridiculous regulation. And the way that Scalia, who wrote the majority opinion, decided to evaluate this regulation is first he asked the question, let's say that the FDA did not include the provision which raised the cap. So let's say that the FDA had actually decided to ban the construction of hotels. Or not the FDA, the EPA decided to ban the construction of, of, of hotels. And Scalia has this whole section saying, no, of course you can't do that. That's, that's not something an agency can do. That is the section where Scalia writes this famous line, we expect Congress to speak clearly if it wishes to assign to an agency questions of vast economic and political significance. The question of vast economic and political significance in, in utility air was a straw man. No one thought the EPA should ban the construction of hotels, including the EPA. You know, Scalia was just engaged in this thought exercise of let's imagine that they actually tried to do this thing and he said they can't do the straw man. King v. Burwell is the same thing. So King v. Burwell, you had two competing theories of how to read the Affordable Care Act. One was that it works the same way in all 50 states. The other was that in 21 states, it works the way that it does now. And in 29 states, the individual health insurance market collapses. I mean, the mechanism for this is that there would no longer be subsidies for people to buy health insurance, which would make the cost of buying insurance in those states prohibitively expensive, which would lead to something called an adverse selection death spiral, which, um, you know, where only very, very sick people would provide insurance until eventually all the insurers pulled out of the market. And in 29 states, it would no longer be possible to buy health insurance of any kind on the individual market. Now, and again, the Supreme Court said that under the major questions doctrine, an agency is not allowed to flip a switch and shut down the individual insurance market in 29 different states. Now, I mean, again, no one's going to do that. No one was ever going to do that. This is just a straw man. Um, so it went from being this straw man to suddenly being under the Biden administration, this thing that um, could be used to overrule any statute, to veto any regulation. And I'm running out of time. So I'm gonna close by just parsing some statutory language. So and you have two, two minutes, just as a heads right. up. I will do this quickly. 
Uh, the statutory language I'm showing you right now, this is from the HEROES Act. This was the text that was at issue in um, Biden v. Nebraska, the student loans case. And I just want to walk you through this, this statutory language here. This was the language that authorized the Biden administration to forgive student loans. Notwithstanding any provision of law, except enacted with a specific reference to this section. My God, that's one hell of a preparatory clause. Um, the Secretary of Education may waive or modify any statutory or, re or regulatory provision applicable to the student financial assistance programs under title. Okay, th this is just, this is all of the law dealing with student um, financial assistance, including the provisions that lay out um, loan forbearance programs and who is in, and who is eligible as the secretary deems necessary. And then I could scroll down, there's other language in here. There's a waiver of notice and comment in here. There is, an, a, there, there is a provision saying that the secretary can do it in mass. And again, I just want to return to this prefatory clause. Notwithst notwithstanding any other provision of law, unless enacted with specific reference to this section, so the, what that means is that if Congress had passed a law the day after Biden announced he, the, the loan forgiveness program, unless that explicitly forbade that program from existing, unless that law specifically said, oh, and by the way, this overrides the HEROES Act, the courts were still required to uphold Biden's program. I don't know how any judge acting in good faith, and yes, I am accusing the Republican justice of bad faith in, their, in, the Biden v, in the Biden v. Nebraska decision, could possibly read this statute. I think it does not, in the words that the Supreme Court used when Donald Trump was president, exude deference to the executive branch. Everything about this statute screams deference. And so this doctrine has emerged from, okay, if you do something big, it could maybe be one piece of evidence that the Supreme that, that, that we will use to strike down an agency action to, okay, we're going to create the doctrine, but we're only going to apply it to straw men, to now it can be used to override the explicit text of a federal statute. It has no grounding in the Constitution. It has no grounding in, in any statute. It should not exist. It is simply something that the Republican justice has made up. Thank you. Uh, Lou, I think you have a fair amount to respond to. Uh, so with that one quick um, housekeeping issue, uh, I mentioned that you could put it in the chat. Um, I think it's actually in the Q&A if you have questions. Audience questions can go in the Q&A. Um, and Lou, we figured out the timing, so you should be able to see the clock on your screen once we get started. With that, Lou, I'm going to pass it over to you to argue the affirmative that the major questions doctrine is sound constitutional interpretation. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you. Thank you as well to the host organizations, the American Bar Association's Division for Public Education, the American Constitution Society, the Federalist Society, the Reform for Reform for Illinois, and any other hosts. Uh, thank you to David Applegate for inviting me, and thank you to Ian for agreeing to participate in this conversation. Uh, I am here to defend the major questions doctrine. Uh, and so this will necessarily be an abbreviated version of a law review article I'm publishing this fall in the Notre Dame Law Review. Uh, I linked that for, at least for the hosts, uh, if they can figure out how to share it with you, uh, maybe they can link that for the audience. Uh, but I'm going to briefly outline the arguments I make in that paper. Uh, and if I have time, I'll respond to a few of Ian's uh, points as well. So in the paper, I offer five independent defenses, uh, and I'll just try to outline those briefly. First, the major questions doctrine is a legitimate constitutional clear statement rule. Uh, when she was a law professor, Amy Coney Barrett wrote the comprehensive article about constitutional clear statement rules. We've had these throughout American history. Uh, the presumption against retroactivity is an example. Chief Justice Marshall and Justice Story used uh, this rule around the time of the founding. The clear statement rule related to sovereign immunity. You, know, you can't abrogate sovereign immunity unless you do so clearly. The federalism canon, uh, and we can name some other examples. But the gist is uh, 
clear statement rules have long been a way that American and English jurists have enforced uh, constitutional protections. Uh, I think Ian referred to them as penumbras. Um, I don't think that's quite the same thing, but again, I'll just make the point for now that this is a very long part of our tradition. And so if we're going to reject the, the major questions doctrine just because it's a clear statement rule, we have to throw out a lot of other parts of longstanding American law. Um, and so Barrett's basic thesis, which I agree with, is that courts can legitimately use substantive canons to enforce the Constitution if, number one, the canon enforces a reasonably specific constitutional value, and two, the canon actually promotes that value. It's a two-part test. And I think the major questions doctrine passes that test. It enforces Article I of the Constitution's commands about who can make law. That's Congress through bicameralism and presentment to the president. Uh, and it enforces those procedures for how law is to be made. Uh, notably, the president does not have the power in the Constitution to make law. Article II of the Constitution, which delineates the president's powers, says that the president has the power to recommend legislation to Congress for its consideration, uh, but only Congress can make law. And so under those rules, Congress cannot transfer its power to make law to others, including the president or agencies. And the judiciary has long recognized that point. Um, in Wayman v. Southard, for example, this is from 1825, Chief Justice Marshall explained that Congress can empower others to, quote, fill up the details, end quote, of laws, but Congress must resolve, quote, important questions, end quote, for itself. And if that's what the Constitution requires, that Congress resolve important policy questions itself rather than outsourcing the decision to others, then it's pretty easy to see how the major questions doctrine implements that requirement. It does so in two ways. First, it prevents agencies from stretching their authority to do things Congress did not foresee or intend to delegate, i.e. when agencies try to repurpose old statutes to solve new problems. Uh, West Virginia v. EPA is a classic example of this. There, the EPA claimed the power uh, to combat climate change and, if necessary, to shut down coal and natural gas-powered plants using a statute passed in the early 1970s. That was decades before there was a scientific consensus that climate change existed and was caused by carbon emissions, and so we know for a fact that Congress did not intend to delegate the power to combat climate change in the early 1970s. The major questions doctrine functioned to prevent an accidental delegation to the EPA. Second, the doctrine prevents Congress from intentionally delegating major powers away through vague language. I agree with the argument. Um, it's been made by a lot of people that Congress likes to hide elephants in mouse holes. They like to pass broad open-ended delegations to agencies. Uh, and I think there's a way you could read the HEROES Act, like Ian suggests, uh, to do something like that. But the major questions doctrine doesn't really care about congressional intent. It's, you know, in theory, it's a rule of statutory interpretation, but in reality, it's a rule of constitutional enforcement and implementation. And of course, the Constitution trumps what any particular statute means. And so regardless of whether Congress wants to give away its power to make law, the major questions doctrine prevents it from doing so unless it uses very clear language. The second justification for the major questions doctrine is related to the first, constitutional avoidance. If an agency is resolving a major question, that suggests there's a constitutional problem under Chief Justice Marshall's non-delegation framework, and that a court can avoid the problem by applying the major questions doctrine. Third, uh, my article makes the case that the major questions doctrine has grounding in precedent. Uh, I frankly agree with Ian, and I'll come back to this later, that modern cases starting with Brown and Williamson cannot fully justify the major questions doctrine. Um, there's a longer history to the doctrine, which I've studied going back to the 
mid 1800s involving the railroad commissions. Uh, and actually Christian Bursett, who is a professor at Notre Dame Law School has traced the major questions doctrine back to the mid 1700s in British law. And so there's a surprisingly robust history for the major questions doctrine. And if anybody is interested in that, I encourage you uh, to check out one of our articles. The fourth justification for the major questions doctrine is that it can be understood as good textualism. This is Justice Barrett's approach that she adopts in a concurrence in the student loans case. Um, the, the gist is that ordinary readers of English would expect big powers to be delegated in clear language. The babysitter hypothetical that Ann referred to is, let's say you're a babysitter and the parent hands you a credit card and says, make sure the kids have a good time this weekend. You know, if you read those instructions, literally the parent, the babysitter could use the credit card to take the children to Paris for the weekend, but nobody would think that's a reasonable interpretation of the instructions. Uh, you would, you would expect the babysitter to do something like buy pizza or take the kids to the movies. Uh, and so that's her point. And the fifth and final argument that I'll touch on is a functionalist policy argument for the major questions doctrine. And this is based on something I think we can all agree on, which is we want a healthy balance of power within the federal government. The constitution is premised on the idea that different branches of government must be able to check the others and that too much power should not be concentrated in one place. And if you agree with those concerns, you should be at least somewhat concerned about the power the executive branch has accumulated in our government. Of course, the president already has significant powers in the constitution, like controlling foreign policy and the military, but now the executive branch plays the primary role in enacting law in this country. While Congress only enacts about 200 new laws each year, the president's agencies promulgate something on the order of three to 5,000 final rules every year. And in addition, agencies regularly produce thousands, if not millions of guidance documents, which as a practical matter, also function as law binding the public. And quantity aside, the laws enacted by the ex executive branch touch on almost every aspect of daily life for regular Americans, including the environment, energy, financial markets, personal health, working conditions, agricultural loans, agricultural rules, student loans, the use of property, education, transportation, the types of contracts people can sign, and even the types of household appliances that can be used. Many of these laws are issued with few to zero procedural protections and all in the president's name without Congress's meaningful involvement. I, for one, find it troubling. You know, regardless of whether you think student loan cancellation is good policy, I find it troubling that the president can cancel half a trillion dollars in student loans unilaterally uh, without Congress's meaningful involvement in that policy choice. Um, regardless of whether the major questions doctrine is rooted in law, as a matter of policy, I think it serves a healthy role in shifting some of the power from the executive branch back to the courts. And you might ask yourself, well, why can't Congress just take back its own power? If it doesn't like what the president's doing, why can't it just pass a new law? Well, the president can veto the new law. And so once a delegation of power is made to the agency, uh, it's basically impossible to claw it back without the president's cooperation. Uh, and so that's not a very good place for the separation of powers in our government where Congress can't exercise a meaningful role in lawmaking unless the president cooperates. The major questions doctrine helps resolve this problem. Instead of forcing Congress to affirmatively act to stop the president from making new laws, it forces Congress to affirmatively act to make new laws. And it thus helps restore Congress's power over lawmaking. And the major questions doctrine is also good for the rule of law. If agencies can churn out new laws based on the identity of the president, laws will change as quickly as new presidents are elected. Take net neutrality, for example. The Obama administration enacts net neutrality, which would fundamentally restructure how the internet operates. Trump then repeals it, 
Then Biden tries to put it back. And if Trump wins, he'll repeal it again. And on and on this will go. The constant shifting of laws is destabilizing. It's hard for businesses and ordinary citizens to structure their lives when the law is so unstable and such major policies are constantly changing. Again, the major questions doctrine limits that dynamic. I want to close my opening statement with a disclaimer. The major questions doctrine leaves administrative agencies with ample power. They can still rely on old laws to issue the vast array of non-major regulations. You know, we're not really getting uh, into the precise line between major and non-major regulations. That's a different topic. But regardless of the line that you draw, the major questions doctrine only deals with extraordinary cases. And so that means the vast majority of what agencies do will not be affected by the major questions doctrine. But the major questions doctrine ensures that the people's elected representatives decide at least some of the most important policy questions affecting the lives of Americans. And that's precisely what should be happening in a healthy republic. So that's my opening statement. I see I have two minutes left. So let me just offer a couple of responses to Ian's points just to get the, the conversation rolling. First, I agree the court has not been very clear about what the theoretical basis for the major questions doctrine is. That was a big part of your critique, and I agree with it. Um, frankly, a lot of that comes down to the personal style of Chief Justice Roberts, who has written uh, all of the published uh, signed opinions uh, dealing with the major questions doctrine in recent years. This is just his kind of style. He's someone who purports to uh, to root kind of new ideas and new rules in precedent. Um, and he tries to avoid lengthy theoretical explanations for what he's doing. Uh, I suspect we might get more justification if somebody else gets to author a major questions doctrine opinion in the coming years. Um, all of the other justices, the conservative justices, have signed on to at least some kind of more extensive justification for the doctrine uh, Justice Gorsuch, as you mentioned, argued that the doctrine is a constitutional clear statement rule. Uh, Justices Alito and Thomas at different points have joined his opinions, sharing that perspective. Uh, Justice Kavanaugh has put out a separate opinion, again, arguing that the major questions doctrine is closely related to the non-delegation doctrine. And Justice Barrett has put out an opinion arguing that it is just good textualism. Uh, so I agree that the court should be clearer, but I think some of them have tried, and I think you'll see more clarity in the future. Your second point is that this is not rooted in precedent, and you talked about Brown uh, and utility error and uh, King v. Burwell. I don't really disagree with any of your points about those cases. Um, I think that the better justification for the doctrine is has not been presented by the court. Again, I've traced the doctrine back uh, to the 1800s, um, and there are other cases that we could discuss. But uh, on the whole, I'm not sure how much we disagree, at least on your main point. I think the court could be clearer. I hope they will be in the future. All right, I guess I'm up again. Ian, you've got three minutes for response, for rebuttal. I, I mean, a, a few thoughts. I mean, one is the reason I'm harping so much on the theoretical justification for this thing is fundamentally what we're talking about in any admin law case is if an agency wants to do something, it needs to be able to cite a legal justification for doing so. I think that rule should also apply to unelected judges who serve for life. I think that the most powerful people in the United States of America should also have to follow the rule that if they want to exercise legal authority, they, they, they need to cite a legal basis for it. Um, but setting that aside, let me respond to two of your points, Lou. Um, one is the question about, well, this is just a way of implementing a constitutional doctrine, clear statement rules and avoidance doctrines do that all the time. I agree with that. Yeah, clear, clear statement rules can be used to implement a constitutional doctrine. What is the constitutional doctrine, though? I mean, I, I can tell you that in Gorsuch's OSHA opinion, 
he says that this comes from the non-delegation doctrine. The major questions doctrine is a way of implementing the non-delegations doctrine. But the non-delegations doctrine, as we all know, like has only been used twice in 1935 and was never used again. The court has said consistently that the only substance to the non-delegation doctrine is the intelligible principle rule. And in none of the Supreme Court's major questions doctrine, if they claim that the court, that an agency violated the, the intelligible principle rule. And I mean, I know that this court sometimes likes to, if they can find an originalist justification for something, they um, they will say, okay, well, precedent doesn't matter because we think that the Constitution was originally understood to implement this principle. But the implement, the originalist argument for the non-delegations doctrine is garbage. I, I, I really encourage you all to read a paper called Delegation at the Founding by two Michigan law professors, Nick Bagley, and Julian Davis Mortison. They say a lot of things in that paper, but the most significant thing that they do is they look at the actual delegations that were enacted into law by the first Congress. So the first Congress, you know, which was made up by people who wrote the Constitution, um, delegated the entirety of Congress's patent power to the cabinet. Like just any cabinet official could approve a patent. Um, they delegated to territorial governors the power to, quote, adopt and publish in the district such laws of the original states, criminal and civil as may be necessary as best suited to the circumstances of the district. So if you're the governor of a territory or an executive branch official, you could just make laws. That was, that was the intelligible principle that, 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 that Congress gave. Um, they gave executive branch officials authority in all things touching the trade and intercourse involving Native Americans. Again, no intelligible principle. So like, if we actually want to take an originalist approach to the non-delegation doctrine, it should not exist. You, you know, or, you know, I'm not saying we should get rid of the intelligible principle doctrine, but the non-delegation doctrine is something that was made up by courts long after that. And finally, and I know I'm running out of time, but I just want to make one last point, if you don't mind, to this functionalist argument. I, I mean, let's take a step back. I don't actually think that the major questions doctrine is going to play much of a role moving forward in the court's jurisprudence. And the reason why is they just overruled Chevron. And so now if they want to veto a regulation, they can just claim that the statute doesn't authorize it. But like in all of these cases, whether talking about major questions or Chevron, no, in all of these cases, they're fundamentally separation of powers questions. There is always going to be statutes that are ambiguous. There are always going to be cases where an agency does something that is arguably but not definitively permitted by a statute, and someone has to have the final word. And there's two choices. Either the agency has the final word or the Supreme Court has the final word. Those are the only choices. And so the question that I think proponents of giving this power to the Supreme Court have to answer is why is the Supreme Court better suited to do this than the other alternative? I mean, we've all read Chevron here, so I won't dwell on the classical arguments. They are that agencies know more about the subject matters they regulate, and agencies are subject to the authority of an elected president. So if you don't like what an agency does, you can vote for the other guy in the next election. If you don't like what the court does, you're shit out of luck. Um, but, set, but, but just setting that aside, the abstract arguments, and I feel a little apologetic for bringing this up, but like, we're not just talking about abstractly, should judges be in, talk, be in charge of this? We're talking about whether John, Clarence, Sammy, Neil, Brett, and Amy should get to met, meet these decisions. And, you know, I, I don't have a lot of confidence if we're going to give permanent authority over all agency regulatory decisions that we, in Clarence Thomas's sugar baby. I do not have a lot of confidence in this particular court for a lot of reasons. I don't have a lot of confidence in the folks that not only just wrote an opinion saying that Donald Trump was allowed to do crimes when he was in office, but included an entire section in that opinion where they stated explicitly 
that if Donald Trump is returned to uh, is returned to office next year, he can order the Justice Department to round up his enemies and have them arrested. And there's nothing that anyone can do to Donald Trump if he does that. I don't have confidence in these six individuals' judgment. And so setting aside the question of whether courts in the abstract, and look, I think Chevron made a very good argument why courts in the abstract should not have that power. We're not just talking about courts in the abstract. We're talking about these six chuckleheads. And with that, Lou, I'm going to ask you for your rebuttal, and then we'll open it up for a little bit more of an informal back and forth, hopefully. Lou, you're still muted. I'll make just a couple of points in response. Uh, first, I agree with Ian that if you think the non-delegation doctrine is completely bunk as an originalist matter, uh, my first defense of the major questions doctrine, probably my second one, won't persuade you. Um, he cited an article by professors Mortensen and Bagley. Uh, I linked a, another article in the chat, which maybe uh, can be shared with the audience, uh, by Ilan Werman in the Yale Law Journal responding to professors Mortensen and Bagley. Um, the truth is the history surrounding the non-delegation doctrine is complicated. There were delegations to agencies in early American law. Werman and others have explained uh, how those delegations worked and have propose what I think are pretty principled lines uh, to separate what would have been understood as an acceptable delegation at the founding and what would not have been. Um, ultimately, I'll appeal to a law review article by then Professor Elena Kagan, who acknowledged that in the first 150 years of American history, delegations tended to be, uh, tended to be more limited and tended to more tightly constrain those to whom delegations were given to. Uh, but the history is complicated. If you guys are interested in that, I would encourage you to read the articles and come to your own conclusion. Uh, I think that there's pretty strong evidence for at least some form of non-delegation doctrine. Um, the framers discussed, discussed it at the Philadelphia Convention. There was broad agreement that the, that limit did exist in the Constitution. And the judiciary pretty consistently, from Chief Justice Marshall to the present, has acknowledged that there have to be at least some limits on Congress's ability to give away its lawmaking powers. We can certainly debate the specifics, uh, but the court has never really denied that fundamental point. And if you can agree with that fundamental point, you can agree with at least some version of the major questions doctrine, maybe a small one, but still some version. Um, the second point that I wanna to respond to is the question of who decides. You know, Ian framed the question as, it's either the court or the agencies, because there are going to be a lot of situations where, as Ian put it, uh, an agency action is, quote, arguably permitted, end quote. And I agree with that, that framing. Uh, there are a lot of statutes that are vague, open-ended. You know, they'll give the agency the authority to do something, quote, just and reasonable, end quote, or whatever the secretary deems necessary and appropriate. Uh, a lot of open-ended, broad delegations to agencies. And I think Ian would probably agree that in that instance, when an agency uses a delegation like that, the agency is the body effectively making the law, the law that binds the public, that imposes obligations on people. And I think what he would say in response is, well, better the agency to be doing that than the Supreme Court. Uh, I don't agree with his characterization of the six justices, uh, but I, I'm not going to focus on defending them because I actually don't think that's the choice here. I think the choice is not between court or agency, but between Congress and the agencies, because the effect of a major questions doctrine holding is Congress gets a chance, if it wants, to pass clear, a clear delegation you know, the major questions doctrine is not the rule that the agency can't do something. It's the rule that if it wants to do something, uh, if it wants to delegate a major power, it has to do so using clear language. And so the ball goes back into Congress's court uh, after the court applies the major questions doctrine. Now, I think what Ian might say in response is, well, Congress doesn't do anything. There's gridlock. You know, we have to have policy made on important questions. And so it's better to have agencies act than nothing to happen. Uh, and to, you know, I have some sympathy for that argument, but that's not the process the constitution laid out uh, for making law. And I've made the functionalist case as to why I think it's dangerous uh, 
to concentrate the power to make law in the hands of the executive branch. Um, you know, the Constitution is what it is. You can make good arguments for having an elected king instead uh, who can effectively just make law by decree. That government would be much more efficient. It would be much better able to deal with pressing modern problems like climate change. But having a cumbersome legislative process uh, prevents the government from making law too rapidly. It protects minority interests and prevents the majority from just imposing its will on all questions of legislative policy. And it promotes deliberation uh, over what is good policy. It prevents overly rapid decision making. So I'll stand for the system of lawmaking in our constitution uh, as opposed to an elected king. So with that, our formal remarks have now concluded. Uh, to our audience participants, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A box. Uh, we'll, we'll take some time to get to those. Um, I have some questions and some points I was hoping you both could address as follow-up. But before even turning to that, I just kind of wanted to give you two a chance for a little bit more of an informal back and forth on points that you made or follow-up questions that you had to each other's prepared remarks. I'll respond to one thing which Lou just said, you know, the point that like it's it's not a the, 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 the point that it's not a stark choice for either the Supreme Court or the agency because there's this third party called Congress. The whole point of these cases is that Congress already spoke. Congress already passed a statute. And like the reason I showed you, you know, I'll, I'll pull it up again because I I, I just think that this the text of the Heroes Act is just so clear. Like everything about this statute exudes deference to the you know, to the secretary, as the secretary de deems necessary. You know, no other provision of law may be interpreted to to over to override the secretary's authority. We're waiving notice and comment. We're letting him do. do, do, do we're letting him dole out relief on that. Congress spoke, and Congress didn't just speak, they spoke clearly under any sane interpretation of a, of a clear statement rule. There it is. There is your clear, there is your, 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 your clear statement. Nonwithstanding any other provision of law, the secretary has this power. If he can use it in his sole discretion, we're waiving all the ordinary procedural requirements. Congress wanted in the moment of a national emergency for the secretary to act, and they wanted to remove all procedural constraints. On the secretary, uh, on the secretary, do that's the choice Congress made. And when when the court then comes around and says, you know, we're going to send this back to Congress, they aren't honoring Congress's choice. They're asserting their own power because Congress already spoke. Lou, you're muted again. Uh, I always fall into that trap. Uh, I know. I, I'm happy to respond to that point. Yeah. Please. There are, of course, <laughs> counter arguments on what the HEROES Act means. Um, I question whether eliminating a student loan can be considered waiving or modifying um, a term of a student loan agreement. But uh, I'm willing to actually assume that Ian's right, that Congress did intend to delegate the secretary, Carte Blanche, uh, to do what he or she wants with student loans. And the point of the major questions doctrine is, well, Congress doesn't get to make that choice, not unless it speaks to the to a major power clearly, uh, because, again, the Constitution has a procedure for how law is to be made. And Ian's right. Congress did pass a statute through bicameralism and presentment. But if his interpretation of the statute is right, what the statute basically says is, well, the secretary can just do whatever he wants and no one can second guess what the secretary wants to do. That's the equivalent of a statute telling the secretary to make law. And this goes back to the originalist point. If you think the Constitution doesn't allow Congress to just transfer its lawmaking power to others, or if you think it's just a bad idea to have an unelected bureaucrat like the secretary or even an elected official like the president unilaterally make law, then you'd be sympathetic to the major questions doctrine, which says, sorry, even if Congress wants to pass that blank check, it can't. 
Uh, the HEROES Act doesn't say anything specific about student loan cancellation. That is a big deal. Uh, and so if you want to delegate the power to decide yes or no on student loan cancellation, you got to be clearer. You got to be more explicit about that specific power. So I don't want to dwell too much on this one statute, but I just want to try, like, this is not a statute that just delegates unlimited power to the secretary. It actually, I've scrolled down a bit. Here is the intelligible principle section of the statute. It lays out all of these conditions on the statutory power. Recipients of student financial assistance under Title VII of the Act who are affected individuals, mean they were affected by a national emergency, um, are not placed in a worse position in relation. So the secretary has to comply with that. They have to comply with um, these administrative requirements. They have to comply on with this calculation of how their income is determined. Like this thing is just full of intelligible principles. It complies with the existing law governing delegate de de delegations of um, from Congress to, to an agency. Now, what I hear you to be saying, Lou, is that the Constitution should not be interpreted to allow Congress to make this delegation. And at the very least, if that is the Supreme Court's position, then they should be honest about what their position is. They shouldn't pretend that they have discovered this new clear statement doctrine that no one has ever heard of before and that they are applying this new clear statement rule to a statute which states things pretty clearly. You know, at the very least, if they're going to create a new constitutional rule, they should be honest about what they're doing. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with you that they should be clearer about what they're doing. Um, I think the court will eventually be clearer about shifts in non-delegation doctrine. Um, I think, frankly, that these cases are a signal, a hint about the direction the court's going in on those theoretical questions. So I agree that the court should be clear. I will just say, you know, this might then be an example of an accidental delegation by Congress because Congress passed this statute unanimously. I mean, it's it's pretty amazing. Um, everybody kind of expected the statute. And I mean, I've looked at the legislative history of this statute. Everybody expected that the secretary would use this to simply delay student loan interest payments for people affected by uh, the 9-11 attacks or for soldiers deployed into war zones. Uh, obviously, if you had asked the enacting Congress, Ken, do you agree that the president should be able to cancel half a trillion in student loans? That bill probably would not have passed and certainly not unanimously. And so I think as a descriptive matter, this is an example of an accidental delegation. Congress had a set of things in mind and it didn't really realize that the language that it enacted is, yeah, right in isolation, it is plausibly broad enough to reach something like student loan cancellation. So, so, so I, I can ask a question that sort of moves us off student loans, but <clears throat> maybe does some of the forward looking. Um, Lou, you in the program materials for today's session, um, I, we had included or they had included a previous article that you had written on this in the Ohio State Law Journal before the, the heroes and the, the act and student loan case had come out. And you conclude by saying, depending on how the court issues a ruling in Biden versus Nebraska, much of the attention will shift to the lower federal courts. Those courts will play an important part in developing the major questions doctrine. Um, so my question to, to Lou, specific to you, maybe or to both of you, um, what what are we looking at in the lower courts right now? What's happening, particularly with the fall of Chevron? Are there cases you're watching that may end up before Supreme the before SCOTUS? Um, what's what's brewing? Yeah, there, there's a lot brewing. Um, I guess I'll start with sort of, sort of the doctrinal question because it's a little bit unclear exactly what direction the doctrine will take. How broadly will the court define what is a major question? How clear does the delegation have to be? Um, just, I think, maybe 10 days ago, the Fifth Circuit adopted Justice Gorsuch's West Virginia concurrence as circuit case law. That did not get a lot of attention, but uh, if, the, if the Fifth Circuit sticks to that, it will be interesting to see if different circuits go in a different path uh, or try to articulate the doctrine in a different way. Uh, as for cases, I mean, the case that I'm watching the most closely is net neutrality which is currently winding through the 
uh, DC federal courts and will ultimately go to the DC circuit. The DC circuit previously rejected a major questions doctrine challenge to net neutrality. Uh, that panel included Brett Kavanaugh, who wrote a long dissent as a DC circuit judge, arguing that this is a major question. Uh, frankly, if the DC circuit upholds net neutrality, uh, I expect the Supreme Court to grant that case in reverse. So I guess I'll answer the question with like a statement of befuddlement in that like, I mean, first of all, I'm unclear why the court felt it necessary to overrule Chevron after they created this major questions doctrine, because what the major questions doctrine says is that the Supreme Court has the power to veto any regulation that anyone actually cares about. What Loper Bright does is it also means that the Supreme Court, or at least the courts, and a bunch of these things are going to become circuit splits that then make their way up to the Supreme Court, has to resolve literally every regulatory question that, com that, 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 that comes up in the entire United States government. And I just don't think the courts, much less the Supreme Court, has the, has the personnel to handle the task that they have that they have just assigned to themselves. Like there are nine justices, they get four clerks each. So we're talking about 45 lawyers who are now tasked with evaluating literally every regulation that is issued by any federal agency, a task that has historically, I mean, across all the agency, there are tens of thousands of government employees who are responsible for doing this sort of painstaking study. I mean, you, you think about the sort of minor questions that come, you know, that that come before the agencies. You know, what should the cable rates be on a particular island in in Hawaii? You know, does a wastewater treatment plant in, in, in Massachusetts admit emit too much nitrogen? The justices don't know how much nitrogen a, a plant is supposed is supposed to is supposed to admit, and their law clerks don't have any training. In how in how you evaluate that, those questions, nor are they allowed to engage in ex parte communications. So they're not allowed to do what agencies do when they try to answer that question, which is call people up and try to find out what the what 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 what, what the correct answer is. So look, I, I mean. I, I think the answer to the broad question, what's going on in the lower courts and how is this going to play out in the future, is just a lot of chaos. There's going to be a huge bottleneck. The justices are going to find themselves bombarded with questions that they don't know the answer to and that they don't care about. And, you know, I hope at some point Brett and Amy figure out that maybe they want to have a date night or maybe they want to spend an evening with their kids at some point in the future. And it would be best if they just give some of this power back to the agencies. Um, so my second question for you all, I think, may Ian speak to your criticism about clarity or lack thereof. Um, so the, the doctrine itself is <clears throat> applies to vast economic or political, political. significance. Or is it and political significance? Because I've seen it written both ways in some of the materials. Both of you say or in your written materials. The materials for today say and. Does that difference even matter? The one um, I've I'm, spotted. Does it even matter to you? Or do you think it would matter to the court in application? So I, I mean, I think the court may have used both. I, I mean, the, the, the first time that they articulated this line was utility air. And our utility air uses and. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, maybe that's significant. But like the fact that they said political significance, I think, is a really big deal here. I mean, what is you know, if Mitch McConnell gives a speech saying that he opposes a regulation? Is this now a major question because the leader of a political party has said that, like, he is strongly politically opposed, opposed to it, it, it? It's just such a flexible word. And. I think it leads to, at times to absurd outcomes. So like, let's talk for a minute about the West Virginia VPA. Th this was, this involved the, the so-called Clean Power Plan, which was an Obama era regulation from 2015. And I mean, I covered the Clean Power Plan when it was rolled out. We all thought it was a really big deal at the time. What the EPA does, it says that um, the federal government sets targets 
that certain power plants have to meet in their emissions reductions. And it's supposed to set them by looking at what the best system is, like whatever the best technology is to reduce emissions. And what the EPA did in this case is they said, well, the best system in this case is to stop using coal. So they, so they set targets based on what sort of emissions reductions could happen if you move towards other cleaner methods of production. The Supreme, you know, the, the industry screamed bloody murder when that happened. The Supreme Court said, oh my God, God this is such a major issue. How could the Supreme, how could the EPA do something of such enormous significance? But, but here's the thing, the clean, the clean power play never went into effect. One of Justice Scalia's last actions before he died, the Tuesday before he died, he was the fifth vote in a shadow docket order that put the clean, the, the clean power plan on pause. So it never went into effect. The clean power plan set targets for 2030. So the Obama administration's goal was to hit what they thought were these really ambitious targets by 2030. And you know what actually happened is that in the absence of this plan, and you know, again, it never went into effect. It was blocked by the Supreme Court immediately. In the absence of the plan, the industry actually met its targets by 2019. And the reason why has nothing to do with anything the government did. It's just that it's much more expensive to generate energy by coal than it is to do it by other methods. So through the magic of good old free market capital capitalism, the energy industry decided on its own that it was going to get rid of coal and start doing other stuff. And so it met its targets 11 years early. And you know, Western VP, I believe, was decided in 2022. So Congress, so the Supreme Court knew all of this. They knew that this regulation was in fact a dud when they wrote their opinion saying that this was a major, I mean, what are we even doing here? Like, like this was not a regulation of any economic significance. We now know that if the regulation had never existed, the exact same thing would have happened. And so what does that leave? That, that leaves its political significance, the fact that Republicans opposed it? Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I, I just don't understand what the, court, what, what, what the court is doing here. If it's gonna claim this power that is supposed to only apply in extraordinary cases involving the most oppressive regulations, then why did it pull out this gun and fire it at a regulation that literally does nothing at all? Ian, I want to give Lou a chance to respond to the political and economic and or and um, sort of the significance of those. So, Lou, go ahead. Yeah, it's unclear to me whether it's and or. Um, I can, I, it might be some kind of sliding scale with both of them being relevant. You know, one case that I saw recently that seemed to lean a bit more on the political significance prong was a federal court. I believe it was in Louisiana said that agents when an agency wants to impose disparate impact liability, uh, that that is a question of political significance, effectively, you know, affirmative action, uh, and that you have to have clear statement for that. You know, just briefly on West Virginia, um, you know, if the regulation didn't mean anything, the government could have withdrawn it or stopped defending it, uh, but they did defend it. And before the Supreme Court, the Solicitor General admitted that the EPA's claimed power would give it the ability to shut down all coal and natural gas plants in the country. Um, I think that claimed power is pretty significant. I mean, these are two huge industries. They employ tens, if not hundreds of thousands of people uh, and billions, many, many hundreds of billions of dollars were at stake. And so the question in that case was not just about the particular regulation, the Clean Power Plan. It was about does the government without Congress's further involvement have the power uh, to unilaterally shut down energy industries? So one audience, I think we've got time for one audience question at this point, which I think it was for you, intended for you, Lou. So we'll have you start and then Anne take a minute to respond. Um, you say the major questions doctrine will only be used in extraordinary cases. How do you ensure that? If the law is meant to be neutral and balanced, what is to stop a judge from using their bias to declare a case is or is not an extraordinary case? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, and I think that part of the anxiety that some people have about the major questions doctrine is that it's primarily been used thus far against a Democratic president and a Democratic administration. Uh, 
But there's no reason why it wouldn't apply to things done by a Republican administration too, such as, you know, immigration is an area that I can think of where I could imagine uh, a Republican administration trying to do something pretty aggressive or on abortion access, you know, trying to claim the power to ban something like abortion treatments to the male. Uh, these sound like they could be major questions. And so we will see if the judiciary uh, applies the doctrine fairly to a Republican administration. Um, I hope that it does. But uh, the question you asked about whether judicial bias will get in the way, that's not something that just applies to the major questions doctrine. That could apply really to any judicial doctrine. So both here and with and in general, I hope the, the rule of law prevails and that the identity of the uh, party does not determine the case. I guess I'll make two responses. I mean, one is I agree that, you know, manipulating of legal doctrines is something that can happen in any cases. That's why I tend to think that we should not concentrate power in an unelected judiciary. You know, if we should concentrate power as much as possible amongst people who can be voted out of office or at least have their boss voted, voted out of office. But setting that aside, you know, you said that you could see this coming up in a future um, Republican administration, including in the context of immigration. That actually did come up. That, that was Trump v. Hawaii. And what the Supreme Court said in Trump v. Hawaii, that was the Muslim ban case, was not that we're going to apply this major questions doctrine that we invented in utility air and King v. Burwell in order to limit the power of uh, the, the power of the executive to determine who can enter the country. They said that the particular statute exudes deference. That's when I got that's where I got that phrase from. So, you know, this thing, they invented it. They let it sit dormant for the entire Trump administration. If Trump wins this election, we're probably going to get a test real quick of whether they're going to whether this court is going to apply the major questions doctrine to the Republican Party, because, you know, Trump is promising 20 percent tariffs. You know, if raising the price on all imported goods by 20 percent is not a major question, I don't know what is. And so we'll probably find out very, very soon if we get a Trump administration, whether or not this doctrine is actually being applied in a nonpartisan way or if it's just a rule that applies to Democrats. Well, Ian and Lou, thank you both so much. You've given us a lot to chew on historically as well as a lot to look forward to um, and consider going both into the election and into the coming years. So my thanks to both of you for your time and insights here. Uh, some housekeeping as we depart. Um, thank you for everyone who's been on the call today. As you exit out, you'll get a little survey pop up to provide some feedback as well as a get your uh, applied for CLE credit. Uh, the next Civil Disagreements webinar will take place on October 8th and we'll look at legacy admissions in the wake of the affirmative action decision coming out of the Supreme Court. My thanks to the American Constitutional Society, Constitution Society, Chicago chapter, the Federalist Society, Chicago chapter, and Reform for Illinois, and being co-partners with the American Bar Association on hosting this. Uh, and again, thank you, Lou and Ian, for all of your great uh, insight today. Thank you.